God who sees our heart. We are the Thorsmiths family. I'm Kristen. I'm Jack. I'm Lydia. I'm Jason, and we worship at Aldersgate United Methodist Church. Today, we revisit the story of David's defeat of Goliath, relying on the strength of Yahweh, our God of peace. All are welcome here. All fools all. Come, let us worship. Please join us in the call to worship. God of love, welcome, welcome us in. in. God of peace, calm our hearts. God of strength, lift us up. God of truth, focus our minds. God, you are here. We are thankful. Now let us pray in unison. Almighty God, we come to you today with open hearts, open minds, and open spirits. We bring our worship, our praise, our adoration together today to you. Teach us your ways, your thoughts, and your love. Amen.
Hi friends, it's Miss Jen and I'm back here for another children's time. And I have a balloon here with a bottle and I'm gonna try to inflate it, which probably seems a little impossible with what I have. Maybe even a little silly, but let's try it. Do you see it inflating? So even though no one could tell that there was anything in the balloon, I knew that there was something in the balloon that could do the trick and inflate the balloon. I think that we talk about God and how he gives us special gifts and talents, and sometimes no one else can see those special gifts and talents. But God sees it in us, and sometimes we even see it in ourselves but others don't. So one of the stories we're talking about today is about David and Goliath. And we often talk about how it's so surprising because of David's size, but it's not surprising to God, nor was it surprising to David. David had the courage because he had faith in God and God saw that David had inside of him the skills that he needed to go up against Goliath. So I hope that we remember that we each have special skills and talents inside of us. And even if other people don't see him, God sees us. God sees us completely and loves us. So use those special gifts. God can help you do things that others might not think that you are able to do. And that is pretty amazing. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God for seeing us completely, for seeing our special gifts and talents. Let us rely on you to use those for good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye, church.
flowers this morning is in loving memory of Kent McLean on his birthday. God's beloved people, let us pray for the church, the whole human family, and God's good creation. Loving God, we pray for men who are expectant fathers, those who are waiting with joy, and those who are filled with uncertainty and fear. We pray for men who are new fathers, that they may be full partners in caring for and raising their children. Hear us, Fathering God. Your mercy is great. We pray for men and women who long to be parents but who struggle with infertility. Join their cries with those of Sarah and Abraham, Hannah and Elkanah, Elizabeth and Zechariah, that your will may be done in their lives. Hear us, God of life. Your mercy is great. We pray for men who are fathers, either by birth, by adoption, through foster care, or through raising grandchildren. We pray that they may be supported in their parenting by their partners, fellow fathers, their workplaces, supervisors, and other men in their lives that their children may be provided with sufficient food, shelter, education, and health care. Hear us, Fathering Jesus. Your mercy is great. We pray for fathers who have lost children, either in utero, through sickness, through war and violence, or through tragic accident. Comfort them, Holy Spirit, with your everlasting presence and assure them of new life. Hear us, Father in Christ. Your mercy is great. We pray for fathers who are incarcerated, fathers who have been abusive, fathers who have been hurtful and neglectful, fathers who have left their families. We pray for your will to be done in their lives and in the lives of their families. Hear us, Fathering Spirit. Your mercy is great. We pray for men who give of themselves not just through childbearing, but with their intellect, their skills, their gifts, and their physical abilities. Bless all men that they may advocate for women to have equal compensation for their work, may be an ally to protect women from abuse and harassment, and may be valued as unique individuals. Hear us, holy God. Your mercy is great. We pray for people of all genders and sexual orientation, those who are transitioning and those who are parenting in many forms and in the many ways families come together. Help us to understand who you have created them to be and the gifts they offer in their bodies, minds, and spirits. May those who are in danger be protected during their time of vulnerability and show us ways to keep them safe. Hear us creator of diversity. Your mercy is great. We pray for boys and men who struggle against the culture of toxic masculinity. We pray for men who strive to protect and advocate for those most vulnerable, children, the poor, God's creation, the disenfranchised woman, and those men and women whose voices go unheard. May they heed your call to justice. Hear us, holy Jesus. Your mercy is great. We pray for those for whom this is a day of mourning and sadness, for those who have lost fathers and other important men in their lives, that they may be comforted with the peace that passes all understanding. We pray especially for the families of Larry Lindstrand, that they may be surrounded by your peace. Hear us, comforting spirit. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for men who have been our father, grandfathers, uncles, brothers, sons, husbands, life partners, and friends. We give thanks for women who have had to serve as both mother and father as a single parent for their children. We pray for men who strive to reflect the caring, affection, nurturing, and friendship modeled by our triune God. We lift up to you now the names of those who have mirrored your fathering spirit, holy God. Give them your grace and bless them in their lives. Hear us, loving God. Your mercy is great. For who else does the church pray today? 
You are invited to share your prayers in our comments. For all those who name and for Ted's full recovery, for Jose joining our church as our facilities coordinator, for Aya as she continues to transition between responsibilities, for Abby's continued healings post-dental surgery, okay. for Abby Rami's recovery from COVID and patients while being limited from participating in the anticipated ways through graduation. For Jen and her families as she takes her vacation, which we pray is filled with rest, renewal, and joy. For Reverend Laura Baumgartner, our former associate pastor, as she becomes an ordained elder in full connection and begins her new appointment at Harler Lake United Methodist Church, that she serves fully as who she is and bears much fruit in the fulfillment of her calling. And we pray for those who have no one to name them. Hear us, O merciful God. Your mercy is great. Holy God, we lift our prayers to you through the Holy Spirit in hope, entrusting all for whom we pray to your great goodness and mercy, made known to us in Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. And now let us share in the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Melissa Pierce is praying in Portuguese. Pai nosso que estais nos céus, santificada seja o vosso nome. Venha a nós o vosso reino. Seja feita a vossa vontade, assim na terra como no céu. O pão nosso de cada dia nos dai hoje. Perdoai-nos as nossas ofensas, assim como nós perdoamos a quem nos tem ofendido. E não nos deixeis cair na tentação, mas livrai-nos do mal. Amém. Hey, good morning, church. It's Michelle Joyce, and I'm joining you from my home in Snohomish, Washington. Draw near and hear the account of the brave young David felling the nine-foot-tall Goliath from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 32 through 49. Today we're reading from the Inclusive Bible. David said to Saul, Don't anyone lose heart. I will fight the Philistine. But Saul replied to David, you cannot go up to fight against this Philistine. You are just a lad, and he has been fighting all his life. David said to Saul, I am my father's shepherd. Whenever a lion or a bear carries off one of our flock, I go after it. I attack it and rescue the sheep from its jaws. Then if it turns on me, I seize it by its fur, strike it, and kill it. I have killed lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will fare no better than they, for this champion has defied the ranks of the living God. Yahweh, who saved me from the lions and the bears, will save me from this Philistine. Go then, Saul said, and may Yahweh go with you. Saul put his own tunic on David, placed a bronze helmet on his head, and gave him a coat of mail to wear. Then Saul fastened his sword on David over the tunic. But David held back, saying, I can't go in these. I am not used to them. So David took them off. Then David took up his staff, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the shepherd's bag, which served as his pouch, and with his sling in his hand, went out to meet the Philistine. The Philistine, preceded by his shield-bearer, approached David. He looked David over, up and down, and had nothing but disdain for the lad with the ruddy cheeks and the bright eyes. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And he cursed David in the name of his God, saying, Come, I will give your flesh to the birds and the beasts. David answered, You come against me with sword and spear and dagger, but I come against you in the name of Yahweh Omnipotent the God of the armies of Israel, whom you insulted. Today Yahweh will deliver you into my hands, for I will strike you down and cut off your head and leave your carcass and the carcasses of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the beasts of the wilderness. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. 
All those gathered here will be witness that Yahweh saves without sword or spear. This battle is Yahweh's, who will put all of you into our power. When the Philistine moved closer to attack, David ran quickly to engage him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he put it into his sling, slung it, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. It penetrated his forehead, and Goliath fell face down onto the ground. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love good storytellers, which is why I love reading the Bible written by a diverse group of storytellers inspired by the Holy Spirit, using all different kinds of literary forms and written over thousands of years. Honestly, how else can experiences of God and our relationships with God and one another be shared? I also love good backstories, and because all stories are interpreted through the storyteller, I love the way it invites me into the story and conversation and to my own interpretations of those stories. No writer, reader, listener are without bias, filters, and interpretive lens. One storyteller, and most of whose books I've read, is Malcolm Gladwell. And regardless of some of the criticisms of some of his books due to his own biases, lens, and style of interpretation, there is something to be said to have his books been such bestsellers that his type of perspective and style has been named after him and referred to as the Gladwellian perspective, and his genre of writing has been called the Gladwellian genre. For me, reading his books is not so much about believing what he actually writes in his nonfiction books to be true or not true, but for enjoying how he explores what he finds curious and sharing his discoveries through his writing. Some of us may know him best for his book, Outliers, where he shared the example of Bill Gates, and as Microsoft is here, maybe this book might be most familiar. Gladwell was interested in how people attributed Gates' success to be really smart or really ambitious. And Gladwell thought to himself that he knew many people who are smart and really ambitious, but not worth 60 billion. At that time of Gladwell's writing the book Outliers, Bill Gates was worth 60 billion. I think it has doubled since then. And since that time, Gladwell himself has doubled the number of books that made the New York Times bestseller list too. I think Outliers was one of the top 10 books of that decade sold on Amazon. Anyways, Gladwell felt that people and our culture's way of understanding success was crude, so he searched for a better explanation. In the book, Gladwell's big idea was the 10,000-hour rule. The idea claimed that the key to success in any field is simply a matter of practicing a specific task for a long time. The 10,000-hour rule can be accomplished with 20 hours of work a week for 10 years. In his example of Bill Gates, he would say that Gates was practicing computer building for 10 years before he hit success. He goes on to share this idea also about the Beatles before they hit it big, and also applies it to himself having put in those practices of writing for the Washington Post and the New Yorker before his success with books. One of his other books, Tipping Point, which, by the way, is interesting because he named the book Tipping Point, which comes from the moment in an epidemic when the virus reaches critical mass and begins to spread at a much higher rate. If you have not read any of his books, that might be a good one to start, especially since we just went through a pandemic. In any case, Gladwell is an observer of phenomenon and wanting to understand them. He, by his education, is not a sociologist, but for me, his books feels like something written by a sociologist. His books are easy to read and, obviously, for myself, entertaining. The book I want to share from today, as it relates to our Bible story, is from his book, David and Goliath. Gladwell is a writer with interest in what more is going on beneath the surface than we think. 
So he picks this story of David and Goliath, and one doesn't have to be a Bible reader to have heard this story from 3,000 years ago, as it is really a part of our cultural conscience. Generally, the way the story is told is how a young shepherd boy goes to battle with a giant warrior and using nothing but a slingshot comes out victorious. But is this really what the Bible describes? Gladwell digs deeper and asks, was David really the underdog in this fight? I'm going to summarize some points from his TED Talk, which I will link here. And I encourage you to listen to his storytelling, which I cannot do justice to, and it's always better to have the experience of listening to the authors themselves as the primary source, as it is available and accessible, than through my interpretation and summary. So Gladwell, in his book and TED Talk, shares some insights he found as he went digging and research to expand his understandings of underdogs like David, and with his five stones and slingshot that made him victorious over Goliath. Gladwell shares that in our consciousness, the term David and Goliath is a metaphor for improbable victories by some weak party over someone far stronger. And he goes on to share how everything he knew about that was wrong and why rethinking our understandings about that is important. Just to give some background on the writer, he did grow up listening to this biblical story as a child with his Mennonite mother reading Bible stories to him. In an interview with him, he shares that he was drawn to these kinds of stories, like this one, and like the story of Daniel and the lion's den, which he found even more fascinating. I like that he explored more deeply that which was fascinating for him, as I think that is part of what made him an authentic writer, so authentic that he has a genre referred to after his name. I thought, reading his book, that his research seemed just as scholarly as some theology academics and resonated for modern audiences. His research revealed that Goliath is not what we think he is, and that what seems strong in Goliath is also the source of his greatest weakness. Similarly, David also is not what we think he is. Gladwell shares some key points. One is that David's weapon, the slingshot, is not what we often think it is. We often think of it as like the child's toy, where a stone is put on a sling, pulled back, and released. In the ancient times, it is not a child's toy when David decides to use the sling. The tables are turned in the battle with Goliath, and David is no longer the underdog. I'll get back to the slingshot. One of the biblical verses Gladwell highlights is when David rejects King Saul, a veteran warrior who offers David his weapons, including his armor, and David the shepherd says, quote, no, I, I can't wear this stuff. Or translated in one version, I cannot wear this for I have not proved it. Or in Gladwell's description, I've never worn armor before, you've got to be crazy. That, for Gladwell, is a critical point to take note. This battle between David and Goliath occurs after 40 days of warring and opposite parties being at a standoff, and as they watch from a hilltop looking down at the valley where the two will battle. David and Goliath will face a duel in the ancient tradition to determine the winner by replacing the full battle of armies that has come to a standstill. Their duel will determine which people will retain control and power over the land. Ironic that David, as we said last week, has no inheritance rights, and yet here he is now fighting for the land rights for his people. David himself rises up to this battle, though he is probably the least favored candidate at the beginning. David, we are told, picked up a five stones and takes his shepherd's staff. Gladwell further goes on to highlight that Goliath taunts the shepherd, who he sees coming to battle with his shepherd's sticks, 
and emphasizes on the plural, sticks, which is an indication of the condition of having blurry vision, which was one of the weaknesses of Goliath as a symptom of his condition of being a giant. In Gladwell's understandings, Goliath, the experienced warrior, equipped with all the weaponry, also suffered from giantism, which often included a physical condition that led to double vision and profound nearsightedness. We make assumptions that giants are strong and powerful, but Gladwell highlights that they are not all powerful like we would think. He refers to Goliath being led hand by hand down to the valley for the one-on-one -on -one battle as an indication of Goliath's physical needs due to his impaired vision. Another point that Gladwell makes is that in ancient warfare, there are three kinds of warriors. There's cavalry, men on horseback and with chariots. There is heavy infantry, armed foot soldiers with shields, swords, and armor. And there is artillery, and artillery are archers, and more importantly to our story, artillery as in slingers. And slinger is what David uses and was, an artillery, a slinger. The sling was a pouch with two strings and stones held within, and the slinger would turn with the sling with seven revolutions, aiming and releasing the weapon or stones with focused vision and precision at its target. It's the way that David managed to protect his sheep from giants like bears and lions. Gladwell goes on to explain that with seven revolutions, the sling had the equivalent to the stopping power of a 45 caliber handgun in modern weaponry. In ancient warfare, slingers were decisive factors against infantry. Goliath's strength as an infantry warrior and victories under face-to-face -face combat meant his weakness of double vision or nearsightedness made no difference. Goliath expected infantry on infantry battle. David was not going to fight him in that way. Why would he? He's a shepherd. He used his sling to defend his flock. That's where his strength lies. We are told in the Bible that David surrounded himself with the tools of leadership that is authentic to himself, a shepherd's staff, stones, a slingshot, and his faith in God. Though these languages of violence, of weapons, are challenging for me as one who likes the ideal that violence is never a means that justifies the ends, and as one who lives in a world that is not so ideal and sees the continued violence, and as one who intentionally practices use of nonviolent language even, this sermon is not an easy one. So instead of asking what weapons of righteousness, the words used by Apostle Paul in today's epistle reading, I like to use the language of what tools of righteousness opens our hearts to have victory in Christ. I actually don't even like the language of victory because it is not without costs. Gladwell's point in revisiting this classic story of the underdog is to point out that David's victory was not improbable, and he's not the underdog as we often assume. Gladwell further thinks that people who are watching this battle from above would have had the perspective have to seen that moment when David took out his sling and would have turned to favor David as the winner of the battle in that valley, though initially he would not have been favored. In the context of the battle and looking at his adversary now, they could easily see that David's slingshot of five stones would do it. Gladwell credits the biblical writers as being fully aware of what was happening and sophisticated in all the descriptions in the story. As modern readers of the story, much is lost in translation in understanding the nuances of this descriptive, which would have been more obvious to ancient Palestine. 
Often we read the story of David and Goliath as a metaphor of how underdogs can defeat giants. And sometimes that kind of storytelling is needed because as he says, quote, if underdogs don't win sometimes, what hope is there for the rest of us? The critical question though, as posed by Gladwell, is that the underdog position is a romantic fallback position for many of us because, hey, if we don't have power, money, authority, and all that, at least we have the improbable winner, the underdog, to fall back on. He says that this underdog understanding exists in our cultural consciousness, and it's a romantic position. It gives us hope. However, he also notes that when people acquire resources, wealth, and authority, that most people want to believe that those things which we earn will prove to be decisive in any contest. In his words, we begin to increase our faith in those measures of results. According to Gladwell, his book is about power. Quote, this book is really about power. Where does advantage lie? These questions are at the center of everything from the wars that we fight overseas to the way we educate children, to the way we fight crime at home, to the way we understand disabilities. There is almost no part of our public policy that isn't touched by this kind of understanding. If you're trying to build the most advantageous educational system, what does that look like? Well, that definition depends a lot on how you define advantage. If you think advantage lies in resources, then you think the best educational system is the one that spends the most money. If you're with David and you think, Ashley, no, having audacity and a fresh perspective are better than being big and powerful, then you might reach a very different conclusion. So I think these are very, very relevant questions for the world we live in. And of course, his other conclusion, just because you're big and strong doesn't mean you can do what you want. So a question for us, what is the power of our faith and trust in Christ and his kinship with creation and with all people? Do we first have understanding of even faith and trust in God as powerful? And if our faith and trust in God is powerful, how is that advantageous to not just the powerful who has it, but to those who do not have power? I think these are some of the questions that our United Methodist Church has grappled with as it relates to the full inclusion of our LGBTQI siblings, and we have been found to be the church that is not unlike the stories of the disciples in the story today in the boat with Jesus and being swamped. Alongside the story of David as an emerging leader with confidence in God that others lacked, we have our readings in the Gospel of Mark with the retelling of Jesus and the disciples themselves as emerging leaders and lacking in faith. The waves and the winds are swamping the boat is no less true today for the church as it was for the disciples being swamped by the waves and the winds. However, we name them. Giants like this pandemic, giants like as we move towards resuming getting back into the boat metaphorically, and through it all, Jesus is present. He is described as having been taken with them, quote, just as he was from the crowds. Jesus is so exhausted from the crowds and ministries, he is described by the disciples as sleeping through the storm. Just like as David discarded Saul's armor and slingshots before Goliath and beyond giants with his authentic self, it is revealed to us, Jesus, just as he was. Jesus models for us how as leaders we are called to stay true to what God has created us to be and to lead authentically. The depth of his faith and trust in God that no storm can shake his innermost peace. The gospel writer of Mark has never 
ever lifted up the faith of the disciples throughout his gospel and is always trying to lift us, the modern day readers, as those with deeper faith than the original 12 disciples and is trying to remind us that we must be those who understands that the risen Christ is awake in our midst. For the writer of Mark pointing out, surely we have more than, quote, no faith that Jesus accuses his disciples of. We are certainly disciples who are little more or less, quote, afraid with great fear, having witnessed what Jesus responds to the disciples' cries, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? We are the ones who knows Jesus cares because we know the ultimate end and the beginning of this story. We know we trust, we not have faith in Jesus, ultimately cared, even to his own death. We are, as Apostle Paul proclaims in today's epistle, people of the resurrection, we are, quote, we are alive. As I was pondering these readings, I came to see that all I need is the faith of like a calla lily. Currently, in the Parsonage Garden, the calla lily blooms. Georgia O'Keeffe used to paint these flowers, and in Christian art, the white calla lily symbolizes holiness of heart, beauty, and resurrection. As I was taking photos of the calla lily, it was as if the flower was saying to me, just be as you are, just as I am what I am. The calla lily is not the peony or the rose or the fuchsia. There is no victory over one another. This flower as part of the garden is in full bloom and glorious just as it is alongside the peonies and fuchsias and the roses. It is being only what it can be itself. In many ways, it's like the calla lily, like Christ was saying to the disciples back then to us now, do you have no faith? The calla lily seems to have victory over me, opening my heart to hear as if it was singing to me. My, my hope, hope is built on nothing less than Jesus on Jesus Christ and, and his righteousness. righteousness. Jesus' kinship extends to that of Kayla lilies, and he is also in the midst of the waves and the winds, the waves and the winds of our fears, giants, uncertainties, misuse of power, inability to use our power. Do we have faith that these waves and winds respond to Christ's authority and power and righteousness? Do we respond? Do we have faith in and to it? Jesus needs no trappings, no outward symbols, armors, or other weapons, no coercive means. Jesus Christ is God's righteousness and ours by grace and faith. May each of us, and as Christ's body, may we be led by the one who extends his arms over us and over all of creation in the midst of the chaos of the waves and the winds of our lives and the world, even now, even still, saying, Peace, be still. Amen. But the voice of truth 
tells me a different story And the voice of truth says Do not be afraid And the voice of truth Says this is for my glory And of all the voices calling out to me I will choose to listen And believe the voice of truth What I would do to have the kind of strength it takes to stand before a giant with just a sling and stone, surrounded by the sound of a thousand warriors shaking in their armor, wishing they'd had the strength to stand. But the giant's calling out my name and he laughs at me, reminding me of all the times I've tried before. The giant keeps on telling me time and time again, boy, you'll never win. You'll never win. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. And the voice of truth says, do not be afraid. And the voice of truth says, this is for my glory. And of all the voices calling out to me, I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth. But the stone was just the right size, put the giant on the ground. And the waves that don't seem so high, from on top of them looking down. I will soar with the wings of eagles when I stop and listen to the sound of Jesus singing over me but the voice of truth tells me a different story and the voice of truth says do not be afraid and the voice of truth says this is for my glory and of all the voices calling out to me I will choose to listen and believe I will choose to listen and believe the voice of And now may we all go from this place seeking to be in God's presence more every day. In the name of the creator, the redeemer, and sustainer, go in peace. Amen. Amen.